it's really been a pleasure for me to be back up uh, back here in the Upper Peninsula. So, because I was in Marquette two years ago, and uh, Bob Jackert assisted that I come to Ironwood on my next trip to, to the UP. And I, he was right to insist on that, because this is just a beautiful part of the world. And I, I'd like to thank Bob uh, for all of his work in putting this event together. I'd like to thank Jim Lorenson, Lindy Gustafson. And I'd like to thank uh, everyone who joined us at Bob's factory this morning to discuss economic issues facing the businesses in this region. It was an informative meeting and also a very instructive tour. So I want to, again, thanks, Bob, for all that. So as Bob knows from his service in the Bank's Advisory Council on Small Business and Labor, uh, discussions about current conditions and people's business plans are important for monetary policymakers. As you can imagine, at the Fed, we have access to reams of data about the economy. But that data doesn't always tell the whole story. And that's why opportunities like this are, are valuable to me. So likewise, I look forward to your questions and comments at the end of the talk. Because um, I always find those to be great learning opportunities about what's on people's minds. But before we proceed any further, I, I do have to remind you that the following views are my own and not necessarily those of others in the Federal Reserve, and especially not those of others on the Federal Open Markets Committee that I'll talk about in a few minutes. So I, in fact, in my remarks today, I'll start by briefly discussing the objectives of the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, which is the monetary policy making arm of the Federal Reserve. Next, I'll present a pictorial review of the evolution of the macroeconomic data over the past five years. So that's the background. And then I'll turn to a discussion of monetary policy. My jumping off point is a phrase in the FOMC statement that was issued last Thursday, right after the last FOMC meeting. And in that statement, the committee said it expects that a highly accommodative stance of monetary policy will remain appropriate for a considerable time after the economic recovery strengthens. So my main message today is going to be that the FOMC can provide additional monetary stimulus to the economy by making this sentence more precise. In the form of what I, I'm calling, going to call a liftoff plan. What I mean by a liftoff plan is a description of the economic conditions that would lead the committee to contemplate the initial increase in the Fed funds rate above its current extraordinarily low level. So this is going to seem very technical right now, but I'm going to spend, spend a lot of time explaining it. So I'm going to suggest the following specific contingency plan for liftoff. And that plan is going to be as long as the FOMC is satisfying what's called its price stability mandate, it should keep the Fed funds rate extraordinarily low until the unemployment rate has fallen below 5.5%. Now, what's the Fed funds rate? This is the short-term interbank lending rate that is the FOMC's usual vehicle for influencing credit conditions in the United States. Right now, that's, uh, the, 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 the FOMC is targeting a value for the Fed funds rate between zero and a quarter percentage point. That's very low. We can't go any lower with it. Now, the important, uh, one important part of this is what does satisfies its price stability mandate mean? I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about that. But in brief, what I'm going to mean is the, long, uh, the longer term inflation expectations are stable. And the committee's medium term outlook, be two years, the annual inflation rate is within a quarter percentage point of its target of 2%. So what the substance of this liftoff plan is going to be is that long, as long as longer term inflation expectations remain stable, the committee will not raise the Fed funds rate unless the medium term outlook for the inflation rate exceeds a threshold value of two and a quarter percent, or the unemployment rate falls below a threshold value of five and a half percent. And not, neither of these thresholds should be viewed as triggers. That is, once the relevant cutoffs are crossed, the committee has optionality. It can retain the option of either keeping the Fed funds rate extraordinarily low or raising the Fed funds rate. So my proposed liftoff plan contains a specific definition of this phrase I mentioned earlier that came out of the FOMC statement, a considerable time after the econ economic recovery strengthens. And in my talk, what I'm going to argue is that this specificity about an event that may not take place for four more years will provide needed current stimulus to the economy. Okay, so let me begin by uh, describing the monetary policy objectives of the FOMC. 
So the Federal Reserve Act is a creation of Congress, and the Congress of the United States has specified in the Federal Reserve Act that the FOMC should make monetary policy so as to promote price stability and maximum employment. And these two objectives, price stability and maximum employment, are typically termed the FOMC's dual mandate. So in January, the committee issued an important consensus statement of long-run principles and strategies. And in that statement, the FOMC pointed out um, uh, that it's difficult to fashion a quantitative definition of what we mean by maximum employment. Now, in contrast, so we talked about a dual mandate, the maximum employment side is hard to quantify. The price stability side, the January statement does provide a specific definition of what price stability means. It represents a goal over the longer run of 2% inflation. But So this is good to have this quantitative definition, but there are reasons why this definition of price stability is not as operational as one might like. So one issue is that monetary policy affects inflation with lags. And we're generally thinking when we make current choices, and this is what makes monetary policy hard, is when we're making choices today, it's really to influence the annual inflation rate in about two years' time. So when you're making choices at the end of 2012, we're really thinking about evaluating uh, them in terms of their impact on inflation in the calendar year 2014. So this is what we I'm going to call the medium-term outlook for the inflation rate. That is the forecast for the annual inflation rate in two years. So that's one operational issue is that when we're doing things today, we have to be looking two years ahead. A second operational issue is that in some circumstances, it may be appropriate to follow policies that lead our medium-term outlook for inflation to deviate from our long-run target. So our long-run target was 2%, <clears throat> but we might not want to, be, we don't want to, might, might want to uh, try to uh, adjust rates so rapidly that we'd have the medium-term outlook for inflation uh, hit 2%. In fact, most central banks, including ones that don't have an employment mandate, uh, ones that only have a single mandate instead of having two, as I described earlier. Even uh, most central banks find that this kind of flexibility is desirable. Now, the, the problem with this is the public might cease to regard 2% as a meaningful target uh, in the long run. If it sees too much of a gap between 2% and the committee's medium-term outlook for inflation. So a key question has to be for us is how much of a gap between our two-year outlook, our medium-term outlook, and the long-run target should we allow. So the committee has made no formal decision about this issue. And my own thinking on this uh, certainly is continuing to evolve. But I, right now, I, I believe that allowing the medium-term outlook for inflation to deviate from 2% by a quarter percentage point in either direction, up or down, would provide sufficient flexibility for the committee, while posing no threat to the long-run credibility of the target. And I'll talk about why I think that uh, later in the talk, about why I think the quarter percentage point uh, sounds about right to me. So talk about trying to talk about the, the, the goals of the FOMC. Um, the FOMC has defined its price stability mandate as a 2% inflation target over the longer run. When operationalizing this definition, though, we have to take into account the lags associated with monetary policy and to allow for some medium-term flexibility around the long-run target. So Given these considerations, in my view, the FOMC can be said to be satisfying its price stability mandate, and that's a phrase I'm going to use, as long as its medium-term outlook for inflation is between one and three quarters percent and two and a quarter percent, and longer-term inflation expectations remain stable. Okay, so those are the goals of the committee. We got we've got two goals: max employment, which is hard to define, and price stability. And um, and I've told you a lot about what price stability means. Let me turn now to uh, the, the describing the evolution of the economy over the past few years. I'm going to focus on three variables, output, unemployment, and inflation. Those are the variables that we tend to get most of our attention as monetary policymakers. And then I'll briefly discuss the implications of this recent macroeconomic history for monetary policy decision making. Okay, so economists typically measure the output of a country through uh, its gross domestic product adjusted for inflation, what's called real GDP. 
So this graph is a graph of the behavior of real GDP over the past 10 years. So the wiggly line, the blue line, is, uh, is real GDP itself. The gray area marks the time period that's been dated as the Great Recession um, by the National Bureau of Economic Research. So it, it, that's about the end of 2007 through the middle of 2009. And during that time period, you can see the blue line falling. That's real GDP falling by 5%. And the gray bar tells us the economy is considered to have been in recovery ever since the gray bar ends in mid-2009. The economy is considered to have been in recovery period for over three years. So uh, there's a real sense, and we have, you know, everyone you talk to and you have this feeling the recovery has been a slow one. Well, the data tells you why, or it tells you that that feeling is reality. The black line in the chart is a trend line that you can see that we were essentially following before 2007. And if we'd kept on that trend line, that's where GDP would have been in 2012. Up here. Now, it's not surprising that we have a gap here, the end of the recession, between 2000, the end of 2000 and middle 2009, between the black line and the blue line. That's why it's a recession. That kind of gap opens up. And in fact, that gap was about 10% at that point. But historically in the United States, large declines in real GDP of this kind have been followed by sufficiently strong output growth to close this gap within a few years. So you see that usually you see this blue line is starting to come back to the black line. But if you look at that blue line, it's not coming back. It's a fact that gap has widened in the last three years. So this is, you know, this is the picture of why we feel like times are not getting back to normal as fast as we would like. Now, this uh, sluggish recovery national output drives what's happening in the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate um, is, is depicted here. So if you look at the be beginning of the gray bar here, again, is the recession. Unemployment rate is 5% in December of 2007. It peaked at 10% a little after the recovery started. So this is right here. Like I said, it's right when I became president of the Minneapolis Fed, which is true. Um, and uh, it's since fallen to 8.1%, uh, which is still well above historical norms. So here, here we are. You can see during this calendar year of 2012, it's actually been pretty flat. I have not seen much improvement in the unemployment rate. Okay, so that's uh, a real GDP and unemployment, both really telling very similar stories. The next graph is a graph of inflation. And this is based on uh, the personal consumption expenditures price index, which is a little broader measure than the, the consumer price index you might be more familiar with. The blue line here is headline inflation. So why, when I say headline, that's including all goods and services. And that's a very volatile, as you can see. It's wiggling around a lot. So the target for the Fed, I described earlier, is 2%. You know, and right... You can see we fell well below that in terms of blue line, came back above. And right about now, we're, we're below in terms of headline inflation. The headline, because it goes around so much, remember I told you monetary policy is about trying to aim for what's going to be happening in two years' time? These wiggles don't tell us much about what's going to be happening in two years' time. So we actually folk, we end up spending a lot of time staring at the red line, which is core inflation. And that strips out food and energy. And the reason why the headline is so volatile is because of energy. So what you see is inflation, as I sort of pointed out, inflation fluctuated notably in 2008 and 2009, and that's largely being driven by a run-up in oil prices, first in the July of 08, and then crash downwards in oil prices that took us into the end of uh, into, to, in, in June of 09. Currently, the thing I want to see in this picture, both core and headline are below the Fed's target of 2%. So that's a brief review of the past five years. Real output has grown over the past three years since the recovery started, but it remains well below what we would expect to be true given historical growth patterns in the United States. Unemployment remains well above both 2007 levels and historical norms, and inflation, whether you use the blue line or the red line, is running below the Fed's target of 2%. So what do these data imply about the appropriate stance of monetary policy, what the Fed should be doing with monetary policy? 
So I just told you the Fed has two goals, two mandates in making monetary policy, price stability and maximum employment. And whenever an organization has two goals, it is logically possible that those goals might conflict with one another. And many observers have expressed exactly that concern about the FOMC's current position. But that these data and the uh, public communications from last week's FOMC meeting tell us that there is no such tension at this time. The unemployment rate is elevated above a level that the committee sees as consistent with its employment mandate at 8.1%. Um, I, I, I would say that for sure. Uh, most FOMC participants' medium-term outlooks for PCE inflation are at 2% or below, um, and that's partly driven by the downturns we're seeing inflation right here, but also using uh, other data, we uh, other, other sources that we have available to forecast inflation. So price stability, inflation is running below 2%. Unemployment is above what we would normal levels we would consider to be consistent with our, our dual mandate. That means by increasing monetary accommodation, easing monetary policy, the committee can better meet its employment mandate while still satisfying its price stability mandate. Now, so this is what's true right now. But an important point is the FOMC's public communications suggest that this lack of tension between its two mandates is likely to continue for some time to come. Most FOMC participants currently project that in the long run, an unemployment rate of less than 6% is consistent with 2% inflation. This, these forecasts tell us, suggest that violations of price stability are unlikely to occur until the unemployment is considerably lower than its 8.1% level. So I, I, so that, that's that's this a message of there's no tension between the dual mandates, two mandates now, and not expected to be is going to be very important. What I I have to say next. So I, it, it, and and so with with that backdrop, the evolution of the data, and the fact that the FOMC sees little tension between the two mandates, and how this lack of tension seems likely to continue, and now return to the key message that I introduced at the beginning of the talk the importance of developing a liftoff plan, an economic contingency plan for the initial increase in the Fed funds rate above its current extraordinarily low level. Okay, I'll start with some background. So the FOMC has two types of monetary accommodation in place right now. It's targeting a Fed funds rate, as I told you earlier, of between zero and a quarter of a percentage point. And the committee has said that it expects to keep interest rate, that interest rate extraordinarily low, at least through mid-2015. We announced that last week. Second, the FOMC's bought a large amount of long-term government-issued and government-backed assets. Indeed, last week, the committee announced its intention to expand its holdings of those assets over the coming months. You might have heard this described as QE3, quantitative easing 3. Both of these forms of accommodation, the low Fed funds rate and buying long-term assets, are intended to put downward pressure on interest rates, both short-term and long-term. Why do you want to put downward pressure on interest rates? It's intended to discourage firms and households from saving or buying financial assets, instead encouraging them to spend on, on, on goods and services. When firms and households spend, their demand for uh, goods and services pushes upward on employment and upward on prices. Now, with all that said, it's safe to say that relative to historical norms, the current stance of monetary policy is quite unusual. In June 2011, the, uh, the committee released a strategy describing, excuse me, a statement describing what's often called its exit strategy, which is the sequence of steps that are going to be involved in returning monetary policy to a more normal stance uh, from uh, where it is now with lots of holdings of government assets and a very low uh, Fed funds rate. What was missing from that 2011 statement was a description of what the conditions that would trigger the initiation of the exit strategy. And what I want to say to you today is this omission of what would trigger the initiation of this exit strategy, this omission is problematic. The current economic impact of both forms of accommodation, low interest rates and asset purchases, depends on key factor, when that accommodation will be removed. So let me tell you about, to, to, try to, try, to, to, to drive home this critical point, it's helpful to think about two scenarios. In the first, 
The public believes the FOMC will initiate liftoff, start to raise rates once the unemployment rate hits 7%. And the second, public believes the FOMC will wait until the unemployment rate hits 6%. So what does this higher unemployment rate mean in the first scenario? It means that monetary policy will start to be tightened sooner. That's what raising the rates will do. That'll lead to the unemployment rate being higher for longer. That means you're raising, you're starting to raise rates when unemployment hits 7. If you start to do that, you're going to be slowing down the pace of the recovery. It's going to lead unemployment to be higher for longer. Foreseeing that, people in the first scenario will save more than in the second to protect themselves against the risk of unemployment. Because they save more, they spend less, and there's less economic activity. In other words, the FOMC can provide more current stimulus. People believe that liftoff will be triggered by a lower unemployment rate. So that observation really frames what I'll describe as in terms of my liftoff plan, which is what I shown you earlier, my proposed plan. And again, I want to say what price stability mandate means here is long-term expect inflation expectations are stable. And the committee's outlook is that the annual inflation rate in two years' time will be within a, within a quarter percentage point of 2%. So why, do you, why makes this liftoff plan good? Why is it an appropriate one? So I just argued for you that the FOMC can provide more current stimulus by using a lower unemployment threshold for, for liftoff. Now, the, the downside of that is that additional monetary stimulus could give rise to more inflationary pressures. And that those pressures are problematic because they could lead the FOMC to violate its price stability mandate. They could lead, lead to, to medium-term inflation outlook being higher than two and a quarter percent. The goal here is to choose the lowest unemployment rate threshold that the committee sees is unlikely to generate a violation of the price stability mandate. Now, where does that, where, why does 5.5% satisfy that? Where does that come from? So I noted earlier, the FOMC's current projections for long-run unemployment rates consistent with 2% are well below 8.1%. Uh, they, they, these projections suggest that there'll be little upward pressure on inflation until the recovery is sufficiently robust that the unemployment rate has fallen back to a level that is more consistent with historical norms in this country. And I see an unemployment threshold of 5.5% is being readily rationalized under this perspective. Although I, we could if you use slightly higher or slightly lower thresholds, it wouldn't materially impact how well this, this plan would function. Now, satisfying the price stability mandate. What this a liftoff plan allows the FOMC to do is to contemplate raising the Fed funds rate if the medium term inflation outlook ever goes above 2.25%. Now, one thing that's interesting, though, is this is really unlikely to happen, or it's, that's way too strong. The following chart shows that recent historical evidence suggests this possibility is unlikely to occur. It documents that the medium-term inflation outlook has not risen above two and a quarter percent in the last 15 years. So what is the sources of, this, of these data? The green book is, uh, we now call this the book, but the green book consists of staff forecast prepared for the committee during its deliberations about monetary policy. These are released with a five-year lag. So that's why I saw this um, up to 2006 is it. So, so these are the end of your uh, forecast uh, of the inflation rate prepared by, by staff. And you see that over the past 15 years, going back to 1997, these things never went above two quarters. So another thing we're going to call below one is, one is three quarters. And that's a different issue. But it's never gone above two quarters. Now, this is actually um, the, uh, the FOC participants, um, meeting participants, uh, a, a summary of their forecast for inflation. And again, this starts when the recession starts, basically. And again, you see that their own forecasts, sort of a really summary statistic of their forecasts, have not come close to being at 2.4%. I think this historical evidence suggests that as long as the unemployment rate remains above 5.5%, it seems unlikely that the price stability mandate would be violated. In any event, the plan does not say the committee would raise rates where the medium-term inflation outlook exceeds 2.25%. Only that it could. At that point, 
the committee's decision in this context would hinge on a delicate cost-benefit calculation that would weigh the inflation increases against employment gains. And that policy conversation would be a challenging one. Among other, uh, among other issues, it could well involve a reassessment of these long-run unemployment rate forecasts that I told you that are consistent with 2%. Right now, those forecasts are most FOMC participants forecast that that long-run unemployment rate is below 6%. But you know, if you start to see inflation pressures pick up, you might have to reconsider that. In the same vein, the unemployment rate of 5.5% should be viewed as only a threshold to initiate a policy conversation, not as a trigger for action. For example, it's possible that macroeconomic shocks could lead this medium-term outlook for inflation to be below 2. Are you running around here or here? And when uh, un the unemployment rate is below 5.5%. At that point, the committee might want to defer initiating exit. And then the liftoff plan is allowing for that. Before concluding, I want to be clear about the economic mechanism that's making this work that is making this proposed liftoff plan generate stimulus. It does not generate stimulus by having the FOMC tolerate higher rates of inflation. As has been espoused by many observers, I am doubtful of the efficacy of this inflation-based approach. I suspect that many households would, would believe that their wage increases would not keep up with the higher anticipated inflation rate. Those households would save more and spend less, exactly the opposite of the policy's aim. Moreover, the idea of, uh, I think this approach is a risky one for central banks to use because it requires them to raise inflation expectations, but not too much and not for too long. So the liftoff plan, and, and that's why the liftoff plan that I've discussed only applies, uh, I didn't want to do that yet, but anyways. The liftoff plan that I've discussed only applies when the FOMC is satisfying its price stability mandate. So that's why there's no inflation being, being generated here to generate, generate uh, stimulus. The committee should clearly communicate its intention to pursue policies that are fully supportive of much higher levels of economic activity. The plan commits to keeping the Fed funds rate extraordinarily low until the unemployment rate is much nearer historical norms, as long as inflation remains under control. With that commitment, households can anticipate a lower path for un unemployment and they can save less to guard against the risk of job loss. People will spend more today, and that'll drive up economic activity. So let me wrap up, and uh, I'll leave some time for some questions. Uh, I've spent much of my time describing what I see as an appropriate liftoff plan. And I propose that given the committee's current thinking about the econ economy's productive capacity, the committee should plan a deferring exit until the unemployment rate falls below 5.5%. And the critical thing here is there, there are important inflation safeguards embedded in this plan. Um, the committee should, could consider initiating liftoff if its medium-term inflation outlook ever exceeds 2 and a quarter percent. The evidence from the past 15 years suggests this uh, uh, event is unlikely to occur. So those of you who are, 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 are real Fed watchers um, may be familiar with the President Charles Evans of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago has also proposed a version of what I'm calling a liftoff plan. And as I said last year in answer to a media query, I very much liked his approach to thinking about this problem. And those familiar with his plan uh, will see that my thinking has been greatly influenced by, by his own. This is hardly surprising because at every FOMC meeting, right next to me is Charlie Evans. So we always sit in the same seats at every meeting. So my building on President Evans' creative proposal in this fashion is, I think, indicative of how the FOMC operates. The making of monetary policy under Chairman Ben Bernanke's uh, leadership is a distinctly collaborative process. We don't always agree with each other, and it would be very surprising, I think, if we did in such unusual economic times. We will learn continually from each other's points of view. And in that way, I believe that we can start to make progress on the challenging economic problems that we face. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to taking your questions.